I think we can help you with that. And he goes, what? He goes, you're not leaving until you try this, this treatment. And basically, I kind of like stronger, strong armed her into doing this treatment. And so he says, okay, let's do this. And so at, this treatment is not FDA approved. It has, you have to go through four um, stages of FDA approval. Stage one obviously is, is this safe for human use and, and you will not die. And so the answer is it's safe and it's being approved. The only reason why we're in this right now is because the FDA asked uh, Director Scott Godley in, in November of 2017 did a complete 180 degree turn in terms of stem cell treatment. Before it was anti-stem cell treatment because I think, in my personal opinion, it's being, being discouraged by Big Pharma saying, let's, let's do this. Let's, let, let's, let's not let it go because you make a ton of money doing it. Okay. Yeah. So, come November 2017, we have basically a three-year uh, moratorium in the sense that they're not going to go after people that are trying treatments with stem cell treatment. And I think the major push is that America has a huge problem with opioid use. And right now, the pain control and pain management and everything right now, right now the, the current administration says, we're gonna fix this, and we're gonna stop the use of opioids, and this is, I think, our best hope, is, is, is stem cells, because once stem cells are, are applied and used by the patient, the opioid use in terms of pain meds and everything are basically decreased down to zero. And, I, and I've found that in my practice, it is basically down to zero already, because any, any of the, the dental treatments that I do, the root canal, the deep cleanings, the extractions, once I, I apply the stencil along with these dental therapies, we have zero use of pain medication. And that night, they basically got no, no pain meds at all whatsoever, and in conjunction with the antibiotics. And so this has been very, very promising in terms of mitigating those issues. So if you ask me, it's like, what is the promise of stem cell therapy? And the one is, stop the pain, get, get America off of opioid use, stop the inflammation, stop the infection, and overall wellness. And those are, the, those are basically the things that makes me get up and do this for my patients. So do you have to, um, what's it, injection? 
is an injection. It's going to have to be injection on the base? Yes. It's a, my, my, my protocol uh, calls for the injection directly on the TN side. And, um, and it's directly onto the buckle fold, which is just underneath the cheek. And then it's allowed to, to distribute. Now the mode, the motor direction, I really think is is the lymphatic system or a neuroendocrine system or both. And so now that we have it, we got our scientists and we're gonna go ahead and do it. And so I'll be back. All right, so I'm gonna start this off with um, giving a general overview of what stem cells are. So there's two distinct definitions for stem cells. One of them is that they can self-renew, which means they can replicate and build more cells. The second one is that they can differentiate, which means form into other types of cells. So there's a lot of types of stem cells. There's totipotent, pluripotent, and multipotent stem cells. And the ability for these cells to create other cells decreases as we go down that line. So totipotent stem cells can make a whole person. Pluripotent stem cells can make any kind of cell, and multipotent stem cells can make specific tissues. So totipotent and pluripotent stem cells, you can get these from an embryonic source, whereas multipotent stem cells you can get from cord blood, Warner's jelly, bone marrow, and adipose tissue. And you guys can ask me questions as I go. So I'm trying to think. So what makes cord blood specifically special? It helps the patient cure themselves through angiogenesis, vascular genesis, and it does this by modulating the person's own immune response to help heal them. And it has an ideal cytokine profile for this healing process. And I'll go into detail what cytokines are in a little bit, but they're basically little molecules that can travel through your body really quickly, and they cause a cascade of events to make other cells change what they're doing and to try and help you. So as Dr. Callan was talking earlier today, these are sourced from day one adult stem cells, which is better than the older stem cells. So what does that mean? There's less likely to have mutations in them, and they're also less, have these things called telomeres. And telomeres are these strands of DNA towards the end, and each time your cell replicates or grows, they get shorter and shorter and shorter, and eventually your cell can't replicate anymore, it can't heal itself. So what these stem cells have is they have longer telomeres, so they have more healing potential. So where do we get these uh, core blood stem cells? We get them from full-term healthy births. Uh, we do a rigorous questionnaire for the family history. We do health screening, and then we do sterility testing as well. So we make sure our product is clean and free from infectious diseases. So what kind of stem cells does core blood have? Cold blood has the multipotent stem cells, which are those tissue-specific stem cells I was talking about earlier. Now, it has two types. Well, actually, it has a lot of types, but I'm just going to focus on the two major types. It has hematopoietic stem cells, and it has mesenchymal stem cells. So, hematopoietic stem cells can make everything that's related to blood, and mesenchymal stem cells can make bone, cartilage, fat, tendons, and muscle. Now, it doesn't mean that when you inject it in the body, it's going to do that directly, but it may modulate your own cells to help this process. So these are hematic poetic stem cells. And as you can see, these can differentiate or change into a lot of different types of cells. And all of these are types of cells in your body, and they all do something else or something different. So when you're injecting these into your body, they might actually call upon these cells to go to the areas of injury for you. Um, to a certain extent, yes. So your body is releasing those cytokines. It's releasing these, these signals saying, I'm injured, I'm injured, I'm injured. And the closer you inject these cells to the side of injury, the more they can recognize this injury and release other signals that say, help me here, help me here. But those cells that are injured can't necessarily direct where the side of injury is. All they can say is, I'm injured, and that causes other cells to direct the side of injury. So the second line of stem cells is mesenchymal stem cells. And now these ones can differentiate into a bunch of different types of cells. But what's really important about them is that they have the ability to release these cytokines, these healthy molecules. 
So what kind of healthy molecules do they release? They release anti-inflammatory molecules, homeostatic molecules, wound healing molecules, and cell growth molecules. So all of these will work together to help you heal. And what is the homeostatic? They're just regulating the body in a healthy way. Which one is protein? They're all a form of protein. So which one generates the protein? Um, one of the issues with the myelin sheath becoming uh, degenerated is it's so missing proteins that need to be. The myelin sheath is like a protective layer around right. the right? And, and it kind of starts breaking off over time. Right. And I think it's a problem with the glial cells, right? The ones that come in and help heal those areas. Am I correct? Or I'm, I'm trying so one to of the research projects is yeah. identifying the missing protein. And they're mm -hmm. trying to so what, what, how this could possibly help is by injecting it into the site of injury, it can tell other cells, hey, something's missing here. And then your body can figure it out. So, this is just kind of more about us. We're always characterizing ourselves, which means identifying the cell population. We're FDA registered, and we work under GMP conditions, which just means it's really clean. And it ensures your product is safe. So, what are the advantages of this? As we, she was talking about earlier, if your religious um, ideals don't use stem cells, well, these ones are okay because they're not fetal stem cells, okay? And there's low risk of graft versus host disease. So, and there's HLA mismatching is allowed. HLA are these markers on your body that tells you, yes, these cells are okay, or no, these cells are not okay. Fortunately, with core blood stem cells, they're so naive that the body is okay with accepting them by and large. And like I said, I have an increased telomere, so those end of the cells that always stay shorter, they're longer. It's off the shelf, so we have a plenty of supply of it. So you're never going to run out of this product. And Can I, everybody hear Cynthia? Yes. Okay. yes. Um, before you go, mm -hmm. what is teratoma? About? It's a uh, cancer. Oh. Okay. So remember when I went back to the embryonic stem cells, pluripotent stem cells, multipotent stem cells? Uh -huh. So pluripotent and pluripotent stem cells, the ones with raw potential, they can also cause cancer. Really? And the reason for it is because they want to replicate so rapidly when you inject them into the yeah. cell that they'll just make everything. Yeah. And it'll kind of cause cancer. Is, and just so you can, if someone has had cancer, mm -hmm. um, is, is that risky? Not this, but is that risky? Um, I like Dr. Kelly on top of that. Actually, um, I have patients that, are, that come from uh, with the, um, the, the cancer docs. And the cancer doc that says, go ahead and get the cord blood stem cells, because there's absolutely no risk for cancer. Right. No, I was asking about the outcome. That you know, if you're looking around, you're trying to figure out which. I I, yeah, I, 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 I are you right? talking about the pluripotent and yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're not going to really get cancer if you're doing like fat or bone or cord blood. Yes. Right. I understand that part. Yeah. But the other ones, the ones that come from directly to fetal from fetal tissue. That's my question. Those that's ones are risky. One. That's a risky. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. So these are kind of hard to interpret if you're not a scientist, but I can um, give you an idea of what they mean. So if you look at the first three on the left, so these first three are markers of inflammation. And you're seeing a patient, two patients. And these markers of inflammation after they got stem cells went down, went down, and went down. And inflammation is always hurting the body. And then, so this marker right here, interleukin 10, is a marker of anti-inflammation. So after the stem cells, this patient was having very little circulating interleukin 10 to high levels of anti-inflammatory properties, which are those cytokines I was talking about. So you can see that the patient's reacting positively with the stem cells. This, these are, this is... This is a published study. Two, two, two patients. patients. If you want to look up the study, I can put you guys back down. Everything I cite, I write the literature side of that. Yeah? 
It says modulates the immune system. So are you saying that the immune system is what causes the inflammation? Yeah, so there's two types of macrophages in the body. Macrophages are a type of immune cell. And there's an M1 and an M2 macrophage. And the M1 macrophage, what it does is it goes to the side of the tree and says inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. And then there's another type called M2. And the M2 macrophages, these are anti-inflammatory. And they release things like interleukin 10. So what I'm going to show you in the next slide is actually this change in profile. So before the stem cells, what you mostly had in this box here is the inflammatory uh, macrophages. And then afterwards, you have these anti-inflammatory macrophages. So what it's doing is changing these cells itself to cause your body to heal, or at least stop the inflammation to a certain extent. And a lot of these diseases have an inflammatory uh, marker to them. So you can even have your doctor possibly test you out for some of these markers and say, hey, how have these changed my body before and after stem cells? Is there a way to do blood tests afterwards and measure that? Um, I know that interleukin 10 is something we always measure in the lab setting, at least in research. So you have to ask the doctor if they can measure that for you. I'm sure they can. It's called interleukin 10, IL. So now I'm going to focus on the neuropathic pain. So as I'm sure you guys are well aware, these things affect 7 to 10% of the population. It's described as sharp, shooting, burning, or electric. So what's causing it? It's either some kind of molecular change or cellular change. And the glial cells and cytokine plays a really important role in this. So that's why I think the anti-inflammatory markers can help a lot. And how it presents itself, I'm sure you guys know, it's just a lot of pain. So how have stem cells helped dentistry? So if you guys look, I know the text is a little small, but what we're looking here are conditions, dental conditions that patients have had, and how long they've had these conditions for, and how they describe them, burning, aching, and the level of pain they're experiencing. So six months after treatment, a lot of these patients went from a really high pain score, say nine out of 10, to one out of 10, <coughs> or say eight to three. But this doesn't mean it's always going to work. Some patients have no response, but a lot of them did. So it might be worth it to try. And some of you, I'm sure some of you guys are taking a large amount of medications. You can see your gabapentin, which is Neurontin. Some of these patients had Neurontin reductions. So they went from 2,500 milligrams of Neurontin to 600 milligrams of Neurontin. And this patient, we went from gabapentin 600, or neur neurontin 600 milligrams, to nothing at all. So some of these patients are having really positive results through these stem cells, and it's really helping them with their pain. How is this happening? Is it an anti-inflammatory thing? Is it rebuilding the myelin sheets? We don't know yet. And the only way we can know that is if we go through animal studies, because we're not going to test this out in humans. <laughs> Who this this is a preliminary report on stem cell therapy for neuropathic pain in humans from the Journal of Pain and Research. And it was a Dr. Vickers, Dr. Carson, and Dr. Tom. So this is a published paper. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, I have a question. <laughs> uh, as I'm looking at this, so after, and I was going to ask you, uh, you know, the other doctor as well. So after you've had this stem cell, you still have to continue taking the medication over your body. Yes. Okay. Well, I, <laughs> but you may see a, 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 a reduction in the amount. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Yes, I care. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, I think we'll be able to uh, genetically engineer them in such a way that we can fix the problem. All right, so I'm going to hand it over back to Dr. Kalilong here. And we're going to talk about trigeminal neuralgia. And I'll have the patient text that he was talking about. So you guys can just see exactly what he meant. So, you want to take over? Um, it's up to you to talk about yeah, so I always talk about the incidence rate, I'm sure you guys are well aware. It's um, higher in women than men, 5.7 per 100,000. For women, and 2.5 per 100,000 in men. Its peak incidence lies around 50 to 60 years of age. So if you're thinking about it, it kind of makes sense that the myelin sheet is getting reduced over time. And 94% of cases are due to a vascular compression of the trigeminal nerve. And 
all drugs are currently used or developed for other things. So there's nothing been directly developed for this disease, as we were talking earlier. And um, like I said, I'm going to go over the patient testimonials with uh, Dr. Kelly. Oh, but, but, but it's not um, so get back to your point, it's like when you go administer it, um, with my aunt, um, she's still on the medication, and uh, but, but she's going back to her doctor and asking to decrease the, the amount, because now her medication is actually much more effective. Even even then, when she was taking her medication, um, she says, I can't take this anymore because I feel like a zombie. It just, it's just, she can't function, and it, it, it just, it's not, she's a seamstress by trade, and so she liked to sew, and she couldn't do her work. And now that uh, we've, uh, we've, we've done this, she's able to, that her medication has actually helped her, and, and now she's in the process of reducing the amounts. And, and so it's, it's, but it's not a replacement for the medication, but, but for some of my other patients, the one with the atypical neuralgia, it's completely gone, and she's not taking any medication. Again, with the, with, with the things that we were talking about, we have a mixed bag of terms of results because I think every individual has different results with, with what, what it is. So it's not a promise to get rid of it completely, but for some it is and for some it's not. And so, yes, please. Why do you think it's, because I'm, I'm atypical. Um, why do you think it works better on the atypicals? Uh, because there's, uh, yeah, I, well, there's no, there's no physical compression. And wow. it's, it's so it's helping regenerate the degenerative processes. Okay. And so I, I really think that the, so when I place the actual injection onto the patient, the immediate response is the reduction of inflammatory processes. Now, I place it in an area that just happens to be next to the optic, uh, the, the, the cervical nerve that is applied to the eye. And the first response from my patient is, oh my gosh, my vision is clear, my vision is clear. And that blurry sign across the street is now in focus. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm going like, really? And, and, it's, and if you imagine the visual field as a grid of like vertical lines and horizontal lines, 